Hello everyone and welcome to the second online event from Functional Fest. Uh, for the ones who haven't had the pleasure to attend the first event, we are a group of Italian developers in love with functional programming. And everything started when some of us wanted to organize a conference in Italy about functional programming. And so we first decided to organize it for June 2020, and then COVID came, and so we decided to delay it to November 2020. And in the end, we decided that also November 2020 wasn't going to happen, so we moved online. And instead, we organized a series of uh, events uh, of online talks, and this is our second. Our first was uh, almost a month ago, and it was Introduction to Functional Programming TypeScript. And the idea of Functional Fest is to gather all the different souls and community which gravitate around functional programming in Italy and abroad. And today we will host uh, Antonio Murza, who will speak uh, about the functional error handling in Scala. And next month, the 11th of November, we will host Matthias Veraz, which is a prominent figure in the DDD community and an FP lover who will speak about parser combinators. Uh, so if you're interested to keep in touch with us, remember to follow us uh, on Twitter. Uh, our handle is FunctionalFest and subscribe to our channel on YouTube and register to our newsletter on our website, www.functionalfest.com. IT. So as I said, uh, our, our today's speaker is Antonio uh, Murza, uh, who is a developer at Agile Lab, and I'll let the, uh, the stage to him so he can present himself and proceed with the talk. So go on, Antonio. Uh, thank you, Marco. Let me start sharing the screen. Hope everything is going well and you're able to see it. So. Uh, as uh, Marco said, I'm Antonio Murja. Uh, today I'm uh, going to present you a talk about uh, functional error handling in, in Scala. So as you can see from this slide, I, I really like uh, alpacas and llamas. And aside from that, I'm a big data engineer at Agile Lab, which is an Italian uh, uh, big data uh, focused company. I'm a functional programmer by chance, let's say. Uh, I stumbled upon it and I do sports uh, outside and uh, in, uh, in the gym. So I'm probably the fastest course fitter you'll ever know. I organize uh, meetups in Bologna about big data and uh, TMD 1991 is my uh, Twitter um, name. So you can follow me or, or just DM me if I'm saying something that's not correct or, or you want to discuss anything. Okay, so uh, today, as I said, we're going to talk about uh, functional error handling, and this is the overview of the agenda. The motivation for this talk uh, came because uh, I realized that uh, in my company, and probably not only here, uh, we use uh, Scala as a better Java. And that is not fair to Scala, since uh, it has a very advanced type system, and uh, also because I craft this talk, because I don't know any other <laughs> programming language, so uh, it's either Scala or nothing. And uh, I wanted to dig into some functional programming uh, talk, but uh, mono tutorials are kind of overrated. And also, I like to show memes to, to my friends and people. And so that's another occasion in which I can do that. So, uh, technically speaking, uh, the, the technology stack uh, uh, on which this talk is based and all the code snippets are based is Scala 2.11 because at my company we uh, use Spark extensively and so uh, we still need to, to run on a Scala version that is compatible to, to Spark with Spark. Uh, CATS uh, 2.0 is the only option available and uh, uh, we are going to, to use um, implicits and type classes, which are a um, um, construct of uh, and a pattern of the widely used in the Scala language. So uh, maybe 
if you are looking this talk not live uh, and you don't know what are implicit and time classes, it's nice to, to have a look at them before uh, looking at the talk, watching the talk. So first uh, thing I want to uh, start with this um, assumption that uh, the type system is your friend and it's really your friend. Uh, I'm not the only one saying it here are a couple of tweets by some Italian developers uh, trying to convince you. Uh, so it's not something that blocks your work, but it's something that helps you uh, do your work better. So uh, I'm going to start uh, uh, because I, I think everyone has a job background, at least every Scala developer has a job background. So I'm going to go back and look at how exceptions and actually errors in general are handled in, in Java usually. So uh, if we want to write a, a function, a method that in Java uh, prints the first three lines of a, of a text file, which is on our file system, uh, we could write a code that looks like this. But unfortunately, uh, this code does not uh, compile. Why? Because Java, the Java language, has this nice feature which are checked exceptions. Checked exceptions are exceptions that uh, must be uh, catched by the programmer and uh, the Java compiler won't let you compile your program uh, if you don't care about those, uh, those exceptions. Uh, I, I see the Java compiler a lot like uh, Jules, which kind of force you to, to handle exception. And, uh, and that is good because uh, actually we are um, signaling in some way that that method can throw an exception. So uh, the error is, is somewhere over there. It's in the signature of the method. Um, obviously, uh, as we say in Italy, fatta la legge trovato l'inganno. So every law has a loophole. Uh, Java uh, not only has uh, uh, checked exceptions that you must catch or throw, uh, but also has unchecked exceptions. And uh, those exceptions don't have the, the nice feature I just showed you. So if you throw an unchecked exception, the compiler won't bother you with uh, handling it. So a common practice is to just take uh, uh, an unchecked exce uh, checked exception, sorry, like the IO exception and wrap it into um, runtime exception or any unchecked one. And uh, uh, as you can see here, uh, whoever calls the print three lines method uh, cannot know if uh, the method can uh, fail in, in any way. And that is bad because it has to look into the code and realize that, okay, that method can fail in some way. Actually, I, I see it as a very bad practice and you should never do that. Uh, otherwise, kittens and developers die probably very slowly, but they will die. So uh, to do a quick recap, uh, Java has a with a checked exception as this handle versus delegate uh, explicit, which is a very good uh, thing in favor of, uh, of the approach but uh, the problems are more than one because it's a language built in so you cannot customize it you have either uncheck it or check it and there's no way out of it uh, it doesn't reflect in the type system because if you use other jvm language they can ignore that and uh, so they make it uh, ineffective um, also in general i don't like exceptions because they are uh, unconditional jumps every time you throw an exception you go back to another piece of code that uh, it's not known uh, to whoever is throwing the exception probably also there's this loophole where you can drop around uh, unchecked ones and so uh, avoid any any control from the compiler so uh, what about Scala? Because this talk is about Scala. Uh, Scala has only unchecked exceptions. Uh, so this like feature of Java cannot be leveraged, but uh, we have a very powerful type system and I think uh, we should make better use of it. So to, to start this part of the talk, I want to, to, to 
um, give some fundamentals about what are algebraic data types. I will be as practical as possible and as short as possible. So algebraic data types are uh, divided into two uh, kind of types, which are product types and some types. And uh, in general types, uh, probably any language that has types, uh, have domains. In Scala, we have the nothing type, which has an empty domain, the unit type, which is the void of other languages, which is a domain of just one element, which is open, close parentheses. And then we have all the types you can think uh, about in general purpose programming language. So Boolean integers and so on. And all have their domains. Some domains are infinite, like the string domain is as much memory as you have. Uh, we can treat them at infinite. And that is one thing about types must be clear to understand the ADTs. So uh, what are product types uh, in Scala? They are case classes or tuples in Java. They can be like records from Java 15 or usual immutable POSOs are good product types. And uh, they do what you expect them to do. So uh, if you take uh, a case class or a, a tuple like here, when we mix together integer and Boolean, uh, we just uh, obtain a type, which has the domain, which is the product of the two types domain. So uh, in this case, it doubles the side of the domain because Boolean uh, has just two values. Uh, their counterpart are some types, which in Scala are um, ciliated hierarchies. Um, so hierarchies of um, classes or objects which uh, are fully known at compile time. Uh, in Java there isn't a counterpart but there are enums which are uh, like lower uh, less powerful version of ciliated hierarchies and they are called some types because you guess what uh, domains are summed with each other so instead of doing a product of the sets we are doing a sum uh, or union of the sets. Uh, so why, why it's important to talk about ADTs? Because uh, you keep the domain of every function in your head when you reason about code. And so uh, if you are able to do this simple math with, um, with ADTs, it, you are able to, to reason better about the code. And also you can think in terms of reducing the domain of your uh, function as much as possible. Also, if you have very precise types, you are um, allowing to have some kind of uh, built-in documentation uh, because your types are, uh, do matter something and uh, have a precise um, meaning. Also, if you want to stress this concept, uh, there is a very nice library about this in Scala, which is called uh, Refined, and I, I advise you to, to have a look. So, uh, how can we simulate checkered exception in Scala because the Scala language doesn't have them? Actually, um, you can model your uh, the output of your functions as a ciliated hierarchy, which uh, can be either the successful result, so in our case, the, the first three lines of the files, uh, or the, the exception that is uh, it's being thrown if something goes bad. And so, uh, we can define a ciliated hierarchy and uh, wrap the string and wrap the IO exception. This won't be needed in Scala 3, but we are still in Scala 2. And have our function return the, the trait, so the, the interface, the upper interface of the hierarchy. Uh, what do we get? Well, um, we get the compiler support almost like uh, Java checked exceptions, because if we, uh, the, the Scala compiler will throw uh, a warning, if the, sorry, <laughs> uh, the Scala compiler will throw uh, a warning if you don't care about all the possible outcomes of your function in a match case, and uh, you can turn that warning into a error, and so have your build failed every time uh, that happens which is kind of like the, the Java 
check the exception. Also, you get uh, ID or compiler support, and you can have the auto completion of all the possible cases for Cilid hierarchies. And you can say, yeah, OK, uh, it works. They're like check an exception, but it's a lot of boilerplate. And so uh, whoever is maintaining and building the, the Scala standard library knows that and uh, has developed inside the, the, the standard library uh, a couple of sometimes that can help doing uh, achieving exactly this with much less boilerplate. And these two types are option and either. So option is defined like the optional of Java. So it is uh, a wrapper over something that can be there or not be there. So none or some in, in Scala. And either is something a bit uh, more complex because it uh, uh, has two uh, generics. And uh, it, it models something that can go either one way or another way. And usually the, the left way is the bad or failed way. And right is the good or uh, successful way. So when you have an either, it's either a left or a right. It sounds weird to say, but it's exactly like that. So uh, we will focus on either because it's much more interesting, but all the reasoning done uh, so, uh, in the follow of the talk can be done with option with some limitations. So uh, we can model our hair uh, as an either. And so we can put on the left part of the either the IO exception and on the right part, the string, which is the successful uh, outcome. And actually we can match case on on the outcome of our function and uh, handle the error or uh, actually use the, the value returned by the function. Uh, I will do a very uh, fast talk uh, tour, sorry, on the, on the possibility that either uh, allows us to explore uh, so that the code in the following snippets won't be totally strange for you. So the first thing is that you can map over an either uh, actually, on 2.11, it's uh, not as no bias in the, the map. So you have to uh, say you are mapping on the left part of the either or on the right part of the either. From Scala to 12, uh, it's not the case. It's by default, it's mapping on the right part. And what happens when you map on a part of the either is that uh, you are short circuiting the computation if uh, uh, you are on the wrong part. So if you have a right and you do, and you do left dot map, uh, nothing is going to happen. Uh, the other way, if you are um, mapping on the on the right part of the either on the the actual instance you have you are going to apply a function on the content of the, of the either. Uh, we also have a flat map where you can change the side of the either. So if you flat map on uh, the left side of the either, you can return a, a right and transform that left into a right. It's something like you can uh, um, recover from an error, uh, let's say, or turn something that is going well, like a right, into an error because you are applying some function that can fail. Uh, also, yeah, um, Scala either has the get method, which is used to take the value out of an either, but you can take the value only of from the correct part of the either, from the uh, based on the instance you have from the left or right part. And so it's usually bad practice because it will throw an exception if you do it on the wrong part of the either. Uh, the good ways out are with a match, as we already seen before, or using a fold. A fold uh, accepts uh, two lambdas, one to handle the left case and one to handle the, the right case, and will apply the function based on the whatever uh, case you are in. And uh, this is a very nice meme came out like two weeks ago about the, the either monad, which is the monad who killed the runtime exception. And, oh, and this talk is, is kind of all about this. So I added it. <laughs> so, okay, 
the, the concept uh, is clear, but usually my programs are much more complex. So, sorry, I skipped a slide. Uh, so let's try to, to build a, a complex program and try to compose more function into one and see how that comes out in using either. So uh, we have a list of integer. Uh, if the sum of the elements is more than 100, we divide the sum of all the elements by the head of the list. Or uh, if that's not the case, we multiply it by the head of the list. So let's try to write this program uh, in the, let's say, most natural way that every Java or Scala programmer would do. So we define some head function, which takes the head of the list. We define some sum function, which uh, sums all the elements in the list. And then our program is just to take the sum, check if it's more than 100, uh, and either uh, divide by the add or um, multiply by the add. And that is the, the first solution that everyone will come out with. Now uh, we can look at this. Uh, signature from the color perspective and, and try to answer this question. And the question is, can this program, can this function fail? Uh, looking at the signature, I cannot say that. I would say it doesn't, it cannot fail in any way because the return type is an integer. Uh, there are no throws declaration because uh, it's a Scala, so they do not exist. So I expect that every list I throw at this program uh, no possibility to failure is, is expected. And so if it cannot fail, there are no error cases for sure. Actually, uh, we know that our program can fail because uh, if we try to extract the head of an empty list, uh, it will fail. Also, if we try to divide the number by zero, we'll fail again because that's not possible. So let's try uh, another approach which is a little more verbose. Uh, so um, we write the head function, but uh, we actually uh, take into account that the function can fail. And so instead of returning just an int, we return an either. And on the left, we put a program error, which is the uh, outermost, uppermost parent of our uh, error algebra. And uh, we just match on the list, and if the list has an end, so it's not an empty list, we return the head, otherwise we return a left saying that it's an empty list. The sum doesn't change, uh, sum cannot fail. Uh, and then we, we write a div function, which actually uh, does the division, but does it only if the divisor is not zero. If the divisor is zero, we return a left uh, saying that. We are trying to, to divide by zero. So now the program changed a bit because uh, when we extract the add, we have to check if that extraction was, uh, was successful. And if it's not successful, so if we are in the left case, uh, we just return the error in, in a left. And uh, instead, if it's successful, uh, we go on and apply first the sum that cannot fail, and then we return the, the result of the apl application of the div function uh, if we have to divide or just write the result of the multiplication if we are in the multiplication case. Uh, so this is a little more uh, uh, longer version, but uh, we can also have uh, another uh, encoding of the exact same solution where we actually, the Biggest difference is that here we use uh, for comprehension and the code looks much more sequential and not nested and helps uh, understanding better what is going on. Actually, uh, the for comprehension is like calling flat map on the, on the hider uh, instance. And so we are just in flat mapping uh, uh, if the uh, return type, if the hider is on the right side, let's say. And this will short circuit as soon as any of these uh, function which have the, the arrow return a left. So uh, let's analyze this uh, function from the color perspective again. Uh, now we can say 
uh, that our program can fail because it doesn't return a pure value, uh, an integer, but returns neither. And so whoever takes this either has to take into account that it can be a left, so it can fail. Uh, and also, since we have a sealed hierarchy for the program error, for we have our error algebra, we even know what are the error cases and we can do something about them. So we can have a, any recovery logic on, on those error cases. Uh, okay, let's try to, to stress this again. Uh, let's say we have all these functions to apply and we have uh, a case class to build at the end. We, we are um, applying uh, F1 to two different uh, uh, parameters and then using the result of F1 uh, uh, calling F2. And then with all the result collected so far, we want to call F3. Uh, this, is, this should be the logical view of, the, of our program, but uh, we're not uh, handling errors in any way. Uh, this would be like the usual Java solution. So uh, let's try to write it uh, applying whatever we have seen so far. So we can do this way and use match on every function, uh, on every return of the function. And this works, but again, it's a lot of code for just trying to uh, handle the error and short circuit at the first uh, error, which is what uh, Java exceptions do. Uh, so it doesn't scale very well, the code is not easy to read, and you would rather not do that. Uh, another approach is using the flat map. We, we saved a couple of lines, but uh, actually this code, which does exactly the same, reminds me a lot of the Hadouken code style, which is not very readable. Uh, the, the best solution to me is uh, to, to use the full comprehension, which resembles a very sequential way of doing things because we are just sequencing a function application, uh, but we are uh, actually handling uh, errors and short circuiting at the first uh, error. And um, it doesn't look so different from the first uh, version where it just added a four and a yield result at the end and changed the, the equal sign with, a, with an arrow. So it looks quite the same. So, uh, so far, whatever we have seen is exactly what you can do uh, without cats uh, and with a Scala standard library. So I would do a quick tour on what uh, CATS instead brings to you uh, to make this even more ergonomic. So the first thing is that uh, there are uh, very nice um, enriched functions on, on everything almost, which have better type inference. Uh, if you ever tried to build uh, either's in the Scala standard library, you end up uh, specifying uh, a lot of generics which are not needed and uh, in the end having the, the wrong type inference. Because when you create a write uh, with two uh, generics, uh, you usually want an either in return and not a write from the type uh, point of view. And uh, uh, cats uh, fixes that. Uh, also, uh, you have some more methods like uh, by map on either, so you can map uh, on both sides instead of doing two maps, one on the left and one on the right side. And uh, in the end, you get some very handy data structures that don't have uh, actually something to do with, uh, with either, but can help you uh, stress the domain thing that I talked to you about earlier and also implement some um, functional, purely functional uh, algorithm in a more uh, efficient way. Like we have the chain data structure that is exactly like a standard library list, but uh, both the prepend and append are in constant time. And also you have uh, this very useful refined data structures, which are a non-empty version of uh, uh, map, list, collection, uh, chain, and set. Uh, 
which are very useful when you want to to avoid to handle the empty case like we did in the in the first example when we had the the list and we had to check if it was empty or not also cats yeah gives a reasoning framework which is called functional programming but i won't cover it because it would take uh, weeks and i'm not the, the right person to do that for sure so uh, actually whatever we have seen so far was sequential apply function a apply function b at the first function that fails you stop and uh, do not even care about whatever is coming after that uh, actually that's not always the case so you have uh, operation that uh, uh, can be performed uh, independently from each other and we want to check what's the result of both uh, think about a uh, form validation on a website uh, when you enter name surname email and so on and uh, there are two kind of uh, websites that accept forms, uh, one good and one bad. And the bad one is, is the one which uh, just checks the first error and returns it to you. And then when you fix it, you submit again and you get another error because it's validated after the one you had before. Or you have those which uh, say to you all the errors they found and, and you can fix all them together. So uh, we can do that uh, in our example uh, because we had uh, the F1 function application, uh, which can do, which can be done independently on latitude and longitude, uh, and we can do it this way. We can create a tuple with application of F1 to, to both arguments and then match and check uh, if it both failed, uh, if one failed and the other was good, or if both were good and we can go on and, and continue other problem. And this works for sure, but uh, doesn't look very good. It's a lot of boilerplate and also doesn't scale because if you have uh, four, five, six uh, things to, to mix together, uh, those cases are going uh, exponentially, uh, are getting exponentially big. So you have to write a lot of boilerplate code. So uh, here I present to you validated, which is a type uh, provided by cats. And uh, looking, looking at it like this, uh, the definition is exactly the same as either. Uh, you just uh, replace validated with either, valid with right and invalid with uh, left. And you've got the, the exact same signature. But what actually changes are uh, the rules you can apply to a validated and to an either. Also validated as useful type aliases, which are uh, like alias for the type and uh, validated the null and validated neck are validated, which have non-empty list or non-empty chain of E on the left uh, side, let's say. Uh, also, as I showed you for either, you have practically the same, uh, same um, function to transform a, a validated into an either or to create a, a validated uh, from scratch. Like if you have a pure value, like a number, and you want to make it uh, valid, a validated of that, you can simply call dot valid and you've got it. Uh, so let's try to use validated and uh, uh, and build uh, our let's say parallel application uh, of uh, of F one. So uh, we build a new function which applies F one to both latitude and longitude, and the return type is an either. And on the left we have one error, and on the right we have the the pair of of the results. So uh, first thing we do actually the same as we did earlier. So we build a tuple, but instead of building a tuple of either's, we build a tuple of uh, validated non-empty chain. On that, we can call the map and method, which will do the following. If both are valid, the, the, the function, the lambda, uh, will be applied. Otherwise, it won't be applied and uh, you will get an invalid out of uh, that ap application. 
so actually our map and won't do anything we take the tuple and build another tuple which is exactly the same and then we will end up with a validated non-empty chain which has an error on the left and a pair of doubles on the right but we want uh, neither so what we are going to do is to transform the validated into another just calling two either uh, and then we are almost there but uh, we still have a non-empty chain on the left uh, but we want just uh, an error on the left and so we have to map that non-empty chain of errors into just one error and since our errors are strings so far we're just concatenating the strings uh, with a, a new line in between and then we can just use our function and uh, what will happen is that uh, if uh, any of those fails or both fails you will get all the errors that you that uh, that happened and not just the first one in the earlier example if the first application fails uh, the whole application will fail and you will get only the first error in this way we you get both because they are independent so this way it's quite uh, less verbose than the match approach Sca scales with tuples which in Scala are up to 22 elements and works really well to combine uh, independent paths of code. So um, we've built quite complex uh, combination of either's and, and validated so I will go with some intuition to, to wrap up. Uh, validated and either are, are cousins because they both express the computation, a computation that can fail or succeed in some way. And the main difference is that with either you stop at the first left, while with validated you go on and aggregate invalid together. So this aggregation is, is not free. In fact, you cannot do that every time. Uh, if we try to, to compile this program, uh, where we uh, put on the left side of the uh, validated uh, runtime exception, it won't compile. And it will say uh, e the compiler cannot find an implicit value for a semigroupal. And that's the, the phase I, I made the first time it happened to me. So, what's a semigroupal? Uh, a semigroupal, the definition is something that combines an f of a and an f of b into an, uh, into an f of a b and maintains the effects of both f a and f b which is quite complex to, to grasp uh, like this out of the blue uh, but the question i asked myself was uh, why either always have a semigroupal while validated does not always have it uh, well either with either when you map over on either you stop at the first error so you don't need any logic to aggregate errors you don't even need, uh, need the, the logic to put two errors together because the first error you find you stop there uh, instead with the validated uh, you have to aggregate errors together and you need to to have some logic to do that so what the compiler is saying with that cryptic error message is, uh, how do I put two throwable together? Because there is no universal notion of that. Uh, while it's there for uh, two lists, uh, two, two non-empty chains and, and so on. And that's why with the example uh, we made before, it wasn't failing. So this merge concept uh, as a name and it's a uh, same group and uh, it's like a um, capability of a class of a type and a type as a semigroup if it respects a rule which in functional programming and math are called laws and this rule and this law is uh, associativity and you probably know that from uh, primary school so i told you i won't teach category theory and functional programming but yeah later i said uh, a forbidden word, which is semigroup. Uh, anyway, whenever you define a custom semigroup, be sure that it respects the, the semigroup laws. So um, I, I hope you, after this talk, uh, will be able to associate these two concepts, which is when you want to aggregate 
things together, you need a same group. And in CATS and in Scala, uh, usually these laws are, uh, are technically encoded as type classes and in CATS, uh, the class is named semigroup. Uh, there are some groups for a lot of types and uh, if if you don't find the semi group for a type which is in the standard library or in cats uh, it's it's probably missing for some good reason because it's not possible to define it uh, in a lawful way and uh, thanks to type classes and implicit in scala um, you can build semi groups for every type you need either custom, imported, and also you can mix semi-groups together as we saw earlier, if you have a semi-group of a list, uh, uh, you can actually combine semi-groups to obtain semi-groups of types, more complex types. So uh, in this talk, we, we have seen a lot of concepts, but I didn't say their name uh, and the name are uh, listed here. So if you want to have a look at what they mean in category theory, uh, you can look them up. Also the CATS um, documentation is really good on doing that because I, even me understood that and I'm very bad at math. The names are scary, but uh, try to go with intuition, understand what they mean uh, in a practical way and it would be much, much more easy. So what uh, I would like you to, to take away from this talk. Um, these things, so error handling is real. Every programmer uh, in its day-to-day -day job has to handle errors. Programs fail. Uh, and you have to deal with them. Uh, you probably don't model them this way or don't model them at all and your application fails in very bad ways. Uh, if you uh, use this way of encoding errors, uh, your signal tool will actually speak to whoever is looking at your code base. And since cats and either's and all the stuff I showed you is quite universal, everyone will be able to, to understand and treat them. Uh, so um, you go out of this talk and now you write every Scala function which returns uh, an either or a validated and you never throw an exceptions. Well, my advice is to use only either's in type signatures and use validated when you want to uh, do non-sequential things, but locally. So in the, in the signature, you expose either and everyone knows either because it's in the standard library and it's fair game for every Scala program. Also, uh, you can still throw exceptions. Uh, and I would say catch only business errors and model only business errors with either and make exception be thrown and, and bubble up. Uh, but uh, do a very um, precise distinction in your head what are exceptions and what are business errors. Because exceptions uh, should be unexpected, like uh, one file is missing or uh, a socket is closed or the network goes away for some reason and uh, for the nature uh, they can also be transient like the file you were checking and reading uh, might uh, pop up again uh, the connection will work not now but in five minutes and so I, I want to treat like exception really exceptional things that are transient that are not uh, given the input uh, of your program they can change over time because of some external factor and in some way I lied to you uh, because this, we are not treating every error, uh, but there is a framework to treat those kind of errors uh, also in, um, in functional programming. And uh, uh, you have to deal with side effects and to, to deal with them, uh, you will need other libraries and other not so different ways. So, for that, I can do another talk or a workshop or whatever, if I find time. And if you want to look at them, uh, you can look at Cat's Effect or ZIO, which are two Scala libraries that accomplish exactly that. 
hope this talk wasn't a gentle persuasion of uh, me to you to forcing to use pure functional programming. And a lot of the uh, pictures I showed you are tweeted by ImpurePix. So uh, follow him on Twitter because he does very funny stuff uh, about functional programming. So it might not be funny for everyone, but it's funny to me at least. So um, my talk is over. I hope uh, I didn't bother you too much. Uh, I've seen popping some messages from, from Zoom, but I cannot see them right now. So probably I was going too, too far with the talk, but I think I, I didn't miss the, the objective so far. So if you have any question, feel free to, uh, to, to write them in the chat. And I will, I will be nice to, to reply. So I'm seeing that uh, Ubaldo just asked, uh, is there any feature in the upcoming Scala 3 for error handling? Uh, I've never, I didn't uh, dig, dig too much into Scala 3 features so far. Uh, but one thing uh, is that uh, for sure there are uh, untagged uh, unions. So that can be used uh, um, like the first example I did in the very beginning of the talk. Uh, I, I did uh, this thing. Let me check. Uh, Scala 18. Uh, okay. Here, uh, my function could return either a string, which is a type I don't have access to because it's in the li standard library and also IO exception, which is the same. So I cannot build uh, a seeded hierarchy, a union, uh, some type uh, of it directly because uh, hierarchy are <laughs> cannot be appended on the top. Uh, <coughs> so I had to build two classes which extend my my error and just wrap them. In Scala 3, you can uh, actually write a signature which uh, is called a union, which says it's either a string or an IO exception and scales better than either because either has just two outcomes. Instead, unions can have any arity. So in this case, it's... Um, it's something that can help. Uh, right now, nothing comes to my mind. Maybe yeah, there are some performance uh, things that matter uh, about wrapping, uh, uh, but um, the, the concept doesn't change a lot in Scala 3. OK. Um, uh, well, thank you, Antonio. Oh, I have yeah. a short question uh, for you. Uh, so during the talk, you mostly talked about either, uh, but you in the beginning, you mentioned also maybe. So I just wanted to ask you if you could spend uh, just one minute to explain the, the main differences between maybe and either, when choose one and when choose the other. Okay, sure. So uh, I can see you have a ask background because you call it maybe, but yeah, in Scala it's it's option. Uh, anyway, the thing it's it's the same. So uh, the difference is actually that uh, with option you don't have uh, uh, you cannot carry any information in the option channel in the error channel. So. Um, Either usually is called uh, uh, the left part is called the error channel, and so in option you don't have it because you only have one uh, one generic, and so uh, you can model something and you can treat the the absence of a value as an error, uh, but I do not recommend doing that uh, because uh, you cannot carry any information about the error that happened. And so if you are dealing with error and want to give information about whatever happened uh, to the caller, uh, I prefer to use either. 
you can also use option. As I said, uh, I usually uh, use option where uh, I need to, to model optionality. So find something on the database. Uh, it's not an either because the value cannot be, might not be there and it's not an error. It's just, it's not there. And so for that signature, I would use an option. Um, that's yeah, the main uh, difference. You can say something is not there, but uh, not why, and not why the thing failed. So, but all the com composable ways that uh, are possible for either are also possible for options. So fold, map, flat map, whatever we've seen so far, uh, it's applicable to, to option two. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, thank you a lot, Antonio, for the talk. It was really nice and informative. I would like to thank also uh, the Meetup Functional Programming in Bologna, which helped us a lot organizing this talk. Actually, this talk was programmed in the beginning to happen uh, live uh, at the Meetup in Bologna. But for COVID reasons, uh, it had to be moved online. And so we were really happy to host it uh, in our functional fest events. And I would like also to thank you, uh, to thank Double Loop, which is providing the technical infrastructure for uh, the streaming. And with this, I would like to thank you all for attending the talk. And I remind you to follow us on Twitter at uh, Functional Fest. And the next appointment is on the 11th of November with Matthias Veraes, which will uh, talk about uh, parser combinators. So uh, have a nice month with functional programming and see you in a while. Bye. Bye, everyone.